Hello everyone. Welcome to our webinar titled 40 STEM Experiments Enabled by High-Speed Direct Electron Detectors. My name is Anahita Parksad. I am the Application Scientist for Imaging Products here at GETAN. Our speaker today is Dr. Colin Offit who is a research scientist at Molecular Foundry, a Department of Energy user facility located at Lawrence Berkeley Lab in California. He received Bachelor of Science in Engineering Physics and his PhD in Materials Engineering at the University of Alberta in Canada. After that, um, he did a joint postdoc with Nemo at Ensem on electron microscopy of metallic alloys and with Professor Osta at UC Berkeley doing density functional theory calculations on computational thermodynamics. His current research focuses on experimental design, computational image analysis, data science, and scattering simulations for transmission electron microscopy, in particular for 4D STEM. Next slide, please. So you can see the uh, question pane on the right-hand side. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to submit them through the pane. Uh, we will try to answer a few questions after um, the talk is uh, done. And we will have all the questions that you guys submit, um, and we will try to get you answers within a week uh, via email. If you have any issues, also please um, let us know, and we will try to resolve them um, as soon as possible. And with this, I give the uh, I give the uh, microphone to Colin. Colin, please go ahead. All right. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Anna. Uh, I'm just going to quickly outline what we're going to be talking about today. Today's seminar on 4D STEM is primarily sort of an overview, an informational session about the sort of types of 4D STEM experiments that we do here at NSEM. And I want to uh, go for breadth rather than depth into all of these topics. But if you do want more information, please do submit questions. So I'm going to have a couple quick plugs for my own facility here, the user facility, Molecular Foundry. Uh, and then I'm going to give an introduction to STEM, just in case anybody's not aware of the experimental geometry that we use here. And in particular, the 4D STEM experiments that I'll be discussing today. And then I'm going to go through a couple different experimental types here. The first one is going to be mapping images that we record, diffraction images, to simulation directly. The second one will be strain measurements, mapping the strain with nanobeam electron diffraction. The third topic will be post-experimental virtual dark field imaging. The fourth, phase contrast, and this is the longest section because I'm going to talk about four different methods that we use here at NSEM for, for doing uh, um, phase contrast imaging in STEM. And then finally, uh, a very brief uh, discussion of fluctuation electron microscopy, and in particular, how direct electron detectors actually really improve these experiments. And then finally, if there's a little bit of extra time, I might talk a little bit about STEM imaging simulations, since we just released a new code to do these types of simulations. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Our facility is the Molecular Foundry. It has a whole bunch of departments, including my own, the National Center for Electron Microscopy. It's a user facility operated by the US Department of Energy. And the important thing about it is that anybody can submit a proposal. And if our independent review committee accepts the proposal, all of your access to microscopes and staff is free. And our next proposal call will close at the end of September of this year. And we do have quite a few TEMs. I think we have nine operational TEMs currently. And we also have a K2IS camera, which is gonna be the source of most of the results I'm gonna to show today. Uh, okay, and I also wanted to mention too, we are organizing an atomic resolution electron tomography workshop in October. If you're interested, please go to the web address at the top there. And Gatan is also a sponsor, so I wanted to thank them again for that. Uh, okay, so let's get started here. What is 4D STEM? Or what is STEM, if you're not aware of it? Uh, in the ge experimental geometry for STEM, we start with a very simple diagram of a converged electron beam. That's our probe. Uh, the only difference between this and a conventional TM experiment is in a conventional experiment, you would have a plane wave that is incident upon your sample, and then you would measure an image or a diffraction image of that uh, pattern after it interacts with your sample. In STEM, you actually use the, 
the uh, um, lenses of the microscope to converge the probe to make a small point as possible. Uh, and then you place your sample at the crossover point where you have the smallest possible electron probe. And for a modern aberration corrected stem instrument, we can get down to about half an angstrom uh, size of probe. So uh, small enough to probe atomic uh, uh, resolution for most samples. Uh, and the resulting image that is formed is in the far field is called a converged electron beam diffraction pattern, also a seabed pattern for short here. And so this pattern is extremely rich in information. It contains all the crystallography and scattering information in the sample. It has uh, uh, information about the thermal vibrations, the phonon spectra of the sample. There's also energy losses here. You could do electron energy loss spectroscopy, for example, eels. Uh, to measure those energy losses and do spectroscopy on the on the core states of the sample or the low loss states. Um, and uh, typically though, in a normal experiment, when you're imaging the sample, you only use monolithic single pixel detectors. In this case, I've labeled two of them here, an annular dark field ADF detector and a bright field detector. The annular dark field detector collects scattered electrons and the bright field detector collects the unscattered electrons. It usually sits inside the electron probe. Um, but this, this is uh, uh, not uh, the only possible experimental geometry for imaging now. So the recent introduction of these direct electron detectors they run at high enough speeds that if we placed one in the far field, we can record every single pixel of the diffraction pattern under each stem probe. And so if we, if I just play this movie here showing what it looks like, as you scan your beam across the sample using the stem scan coils to move it around here, uh, you get a scattered signal on your high angle annular dark field detector but you can also use the high speed direct electron detector to record the full pattern here. So this is where the name 4D stem comes from because we typically scan the beam in a two dimensional pattern on the sample surface, a grid of probe positions. And we also record a full two dimensional image at each probe position. And so this creates a four dimensional data set that we're gonna use to do the experiments that I'm gonna show today here. Uh, this is one of our first sort of experimental data sets on the Team 1 microscope, an aberration corrected FEI Titan microscope. It's on a two dimensional material, tungsten disulfide. Part of the sample was single layer and part of it was two layer. And if you look in the far field, you can see each of the diffraction patterns contains that local crystallographic information. And you can see the difference between a zero layer unscattered probe, uh, where it's sort of passing through a hole in the material on the center beam there, on the left-hand beam, you can see where it passes through a single layer and on the right-hand beam where it passes through two layers. So it's very easy in this case to see the difference between one layer and two layer just from the diffraction pattern alone. But this image doesn't really show the whole story. Each one of these diffraction patterns is an average of hundreds and hundreds of adjacent diffraction patterns. The reality looks a little bit more like this. And even this is still a ridiculous oversimplification each one of these diffraction patterns is an average of seven by seven diffraction patterns, so 49 diffraction patterns. Uh, that means the experimental data set for this one is 256 by 256 probe positions, and this is on the K2IS camera, so every single one of these images is 1920 by 1792 pixel size. Uh, this forms a four dimensional data set that's just over 420 gigabytes of information. And it requires about three minutes to record on this camera. So as you can imagine, data manipulation and sort of pre-processing, processing and post-processing is the biggest challenge for these experiments. The amount of information created in about uh, 15 minutes is roughly equal to sort of conventional two dimensional imaging uh, that our microscopes record in an entire year. So each of these experiments uh, requires pretty, pretty fancy software codes to be able to go through all of this data here. Um, okay, so the first topic I'm gonna actually discuss experimentally is called PACBED. That stands for Position Averaged Convergent Beam Electron Diffraction. And this is the sort of simplest possible way to use the data. We're gonna match our experimental diffraction patterns directly to simulation. So first, what does a conventional image look like? This is a, a sort of multi-layer stack material. It alternates between layers of strontium titanate and a mixture of strontium titanate and lanthanum manganate. And it was deposited with pulse laser deposition. Each one of these layers is about seven unit cells and there's 120 of them. So almost a thousand planes here. 
in the conventional imaging, um, if we record at very, very high resolution, we can form an atomic resolution image of the perovskite structure. And if I zoom in, you can see a huge amount of information here. All of the atomic columns are resolved where the A sites and the B sites exist. But in between where the oxygens are, you can't see a lot of scattering. And that's because this is an annular dark field image. It captures only the highly scattered electrons. Uh, but interpreting this, in, this information is not trivial. Uh, as, you, as you see the multilayer stack here, some of the atomic columns are significantly brighter than other atomic columns, but it's difficult to tell whether that's due to thickness change, composition change, or, or some kind of induced polarization, something like that. So what we want to do is extract more information from patterns like this. And so 4D STEM can allow us to do that. So if we perform a four-dimensional STEM experiment, this is the type of convergent beam electron diffraction image you get from the previous sample. And so this is the mean image of thousands of these STEM uh, uh, far field diffraction patterns here recorded on the 001 zone axis, about 16,000 different images here. And this was actually done on our uncorrected Titan microscope, but using the K2IS camera. Uh, and so these patterns are what we're going to use to match to our, to our simulations. Um, so if you were to look at the sort of conventional experiment, 4D STEM experiment at the top, you get the HADAF, uh, a conventional image, excuse me. Uh, and then simultaneously, we record those 4D STEM seabed images. And what I've done here at the bottom is I summed up all of the pixels on the center disk. So this forms a sort of bright field image and it's complementary to the HADAF image. And you can see a huge amount of streaking along the beam direction. That streaking is because this is before we had synchronized our camera to the STEM scan coils, but we've since solved this issue here. Um, and so the difference between the top and the bottom is although the top sort of has bright co contrast on the A and a little bit of contrast on the B sites, um, and the bottom has dark contrast, they're roughly complementary, the bottom image has a full diffraction pattern under each pixel. And so these patterns contain all of the local scattering information, the scattering cross sections. So we could work out if we have a good enough simulation the thickness and the composition, for example. And that's what I'm going to show next here. So to do that, we're going to turn to the pack bed technique. This was introduced by uh, Lebeau and Stemmers and Les Allen and a few other people. Uh, in, in the sort of 4D STEM sense, we're going to fit a mean lattice, a best fit lattice to all of our atomic sites. And under each unit cell, I'm going to take all of these pixels and average them in the diffraction plane to form a pack bed pattern, a position averaged seabed pattern. So for each unit cell, we produce a very, very clean high signal to noise diffraction pattern. And it's quite subtle in this particular data set, but as you travel across from the STO layer to the STO LMO layers, you can see clearly the scattering cross section is changing a little bit. So if we combine that with multi-slice simulations, and I'm not going to go into the details here, uh, we're using the cross sections, uh, scattering potentials, et cetera, from Kirkland's book here. Uh, we can make a library of all of uh, our scattering seabed patterns as a function of composition and thickness. And so if I just increase the contrast here, you can see there's a really strong dependence on thickness and a somewhat weaker dependence on the composition here. This is just the center disk position. So for each one of those previous experimental seabed images, pack bed images, I can match it to this simulation. And that's what this one looks like here. So for this data set, the best fit overall thickness was 7.5 nanometers thick. Um, and then uh, the composition map below shows that we can sort of pick up this multi-layer uh, stack geometry as you alternate between STO and LMO composition here. And another data set, for example, very slightly thicker, a little bit further from the edge of this foil, we get essentially the same thing. So this is actually very interesting because this is not a spectroscopic measurement. All we're using is the intensity uh, resolved uh, over the momentum vectors in the pack bed images. And we can pull out very, very subtle differences in these scattering signals, including composition here. And it is very subtle. If I flip back, if you look at the pure STO to pure LMO, even for the thickest sample, the patterns are still quite similar to each other. It's sort of the details of the patterns, exactly how bright the different disk overlap regions are. That's what provides us with our compositional signal vector here. Uh, okay, so this is just sort of the final overall plot showing how good the agreement is between the experiment and the simulation. 
the simulation and experimental images are much more similar to each other than than the sort of experiment at two different compositions or, or simulation at two different compositions. Uh, and if we want to sort of double check these results here, we could compare them to a traditional eels measurement. In this case, using the B site edges on our aberration corrected microscope. And if we plot that composition, we see it alternates between about 0% LMO and about 80% LMO. So it's in very good agreement with our, with our pack bed measured compositions. Uh, okay, so that's sort of the very simplest 4D STEM experiment. You compute a library of diffracted patterns and you compare them directly to your experiment. But we have all this information here and sometimes you can't actually do a simulation because you don't necessarily know what you're looking at in detail or, or you want to vary many different measurements uh, vectors. Uh, polarization, thickness, sample tilt, aberrations, probe size, lots of different parameters here. Uh, so if you don't want to do the simulation, you can also dive into the data directly to get some information. And one of the first easiest experiments we did is just virtual dark field imaging here. Um, and I'm going to show some examples from that now. So this is a alloy. Uh, it's sort of a BCC uh, F FE matrix with some precipitates. And you can see there's a couple different precipitate compositions, but they're all epitaxial. They all form conventional uh, uh, sort of cubic or square diffraction patterns here all aligned along this 001 zone axis. So at the top, I've shown the traditional images. You can get a, a real space image or a diffraction pattern of the sample, um, but in interpreting what all the contrast means in the image is not trivial. Often you have to do selected area diffraction where you place an aperture over the matrix or over the precipitate or over the shell of the precipitate in order to solve exactly what structure it is. But from one 4D stem data cube here, where we recorded about 65,000 dark field uh, seabed images here, um, uh, we can pull out a lot more information. So on the left hand side here in the upper left, I'm showing the virtual image. And this is from a, a paper that Christoph Gammer, a former NSEM uh, postdoc wrote here. And you can see in the green triangle, the blue square and the red circle, the different virtual diffraction patterns. And these are formed by simply summing up all of the diffraction patterns underneath those pixels. And you can see this is a fingerprint of all of the different phases here. We can tell the difference between the different local ordering based only on the intensity or absence of the various diffraction spots here. And so alternatively, you can approach the data from the diffraction side. On the right hand side, I've shown, or Kristoff has shown, I should say, um, green circles, red circles, and blue circles corresponding to the various unique or shared diffraction points. And if you simply sum up all of the pixels in diffraction space for each probe position, you can then form an image for each probe position, a virtual image from those diffracted spots. And that's shown in B, C, and D on the right-hand side as the blue, the red, and the green uh, circles respectively here. So this is a single experiment and we more or less collected all of the local diffraction patterns, the local sort of selected area diffraction patterns for each individual probe uh, at this grid of 256 by 256 probe positions. And so this is an example of how you can collect a single data set and perform many, many different experiments with it. So another example I'm going to show for this virtual imaging is this lithium rich transition uh, metal oxides. And so this is a sort of conventional study we did a couple of years ago showing annular dark field images. And I just want to show it to show that these are, are structurally very rich and complicated materials along. This is the same sample, but along different zone axes here. And you can see uh, there's a different surface layer. There's a lot of sort of stacking defects. And this material in particular, these images don't cleanly show it. It has a lot of uh, um, sort of random stacking defects. This, this particular zone shows it really nicely. So in the upper left, I've shown the HADAP image here. And in the middle, I've colored it by the local sort of stacking of these dumbbell structures. And this just represents where the transition metals uh, are in one of three sites and lithium is on, uh, or sorry, lithium's on two of the three. Uh, or one of the three sites and the TMOs, TMs are on two of the sites forming a dumbbell structure. And so I've colored it blue, green, and orange based on the different local orientation here. Um, and, but the problem with a study like this is these particles are gigantic. They are micrometer in size. And what we want is good statistics. We wanna know what the sort of density of these stacking faults are, but over the entire particle. So once again, we turn to virtual imaging with 4D STEM.
And so these three different stacking sequences form very slightly different diffraction patterns that we can use to measure which of the three variants is directly underneath the probe. And so what this looks like uh, is a data set like this. On the upper left, I've shown the mean seabed image for these lithium rich uh, TMOs. And on the right, a virtual dark field image. Uh, um, but if I put a mask over the sample and I fit where these diffraction spots are, I'm just showing where the beam stop is here on the center probe. Uh, I can make a virtual dark field just like we did in the previous data set and form an image. And that's what I'm showing on the right here. But I don't have to use all of the diffracted spots. I can grab just a subset. These two diffraction spots are, are much more highly excited for the surface structure. So we can pull out the difference between the phases on this entire monolithic particle. It's missing the scale bar, but it's about a, a, a micrometer across roughly here. Uh, and if I choose every third site in the upper left here, I can form a virtual image corresponding to one of those three variants that I showed previously. And if I move to the next one, or the next one, I can pull out all three variants uh, uh, simultaneously here. And then finally, I can make a merged image in red, green, and blue that shows the density of these stacking defects and their, their overall size here. And again, this is just from a single 4D STEM experiment collected over this entire particle. Um, and then finally, the last virtual dark field I want to show is a more challenging experiment. This is that tungsten disul disul disulfide data set I showed in that big overarching image uh, earlier in the talk here. And once again, in blue, green, and red, I've circled a bunch of the probe positions and, and shown the diffraction patterns. They're quite similar to each other, but the slight differences between, uh, between the sort of intensity of the disks and the overlap region can be used to tell the difference between the stacking sequences or, or whether it's single layer, zero layer, two layer, three layer, et cetera. And so what I wanna show in this data set is forming some complex virtual dark field images. So a couple simple ones first on the lower left. If I make a, a virtual bright field where I flip the contrast, that's the upper right of that panel, or a, uh, 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 bright field where I extend beyond the center disk, the center disk is labeled in red there, I can form some clean atomic resolution images showing the tungsten sites of this lattice. Um, or I can show annular dark field in the lower left or annular bright field in the lower right. And so if you look really closely, the annular bright field in the lower right of this panel is much cleaner than the other two atomic resolution images. So this shows the real power of virtual dark field imaging. You don't have to set your detector inner angle and your detector outer angle before you do the experiment. You can do it in post-processing after to form the best possible quality image. And so we're not limited to circular apertures, of course. I can make arbitrarily complicated images uh, on diffraction space here, showing, for example, the unoverlapped disk regions in dark field or bright field, or below in this panel, the triple overlap or double overlap regions. And you can really see that atomic resolution contrast in coherent uh, diffraction imaging does come from the overlapping scattered Bragg disks here. It's these double and triple overlap regions that lead to our atomic resolution contrast. And of course, you can do arbitrarily complex ones where you subtract some regions and add other regions, and you can form almost any type of virtual image that you would like. And so this, again, this is all one data set, a single experiment recorded in three, three minutes on our K2 camera on the aberration corrected Team 1 microscope. Uh, but we can perform many, many, many different experiments after the fact. Um, and this data set uh, uh, actually shows too, if you could measure where the disk positions are, you could also measure with extreme accuracy the local rotation of the lattice or the orientation of it. You could look for grain boundaries. And if you could measure the disk positions with high enough fidelity, you could even map the local lattice vectors, so the strain of the sample. And that's what I'm going to show next here. So this is typically referred to in the literature as nanobeam electron diffraction strain mapping, NBED. And for this type of uh, data set, we want to set the, the probe size, the probe semi-angle, so that none of the disks overlap, like the two images I'm showing below there. Because if the disks don't overlap, you can measure their precision or their position with very high precision. And slight subpixel shifts of the disk can be used to measure strains even significantly below 1%. So stream mapping is very important for many, many different studies. This is what a conventional geometric phase analysis or GPA strain analysis looks like on a simple semiconductor uh, sample. 
So on the left here, you can see the overall dark field geometry. We have a gallium phosphide substrate and aluminum gallium arsenide phosphate film, and then a, a lattice match gallium arsenide gallium arsenide phosphate sample on the uh, Upper, upper part of it there. So if we zoom in on that, we can use conventional high resolution stem imaging here to form an atomic resolution image. That's what I'm showing in panel B here. The white box is a zoomed in image showing the dumbbell structure that we can see. And by measuring the shift of these peaks, we can form a, a strain map, which I'm showing on the lower left and the lower right here in panel C and D. And so this is strain perpendicular to the growth direction in C and parallel to the growth direction in D. And so overall, it shows what you'd expect. This film is epitaxially locked, so you don't get any strain in D. It's just a noise field, more or less. But in C, you can see the different lattice layers of these alternating uh, uh, materials here, these strain matched uh, semiconductor materials. Um, but once again, this study has sort of a major limitation. There's quite a bit of noise introduced by the geometric phase analysis, and our overall field of view is only about 50 nanometers by 50 nanometers. So we want, what we want to do with four-dimensional STEM experiments is get the same quality of data, but over a much, much larger area. And so that's what I'm going to show next here. So the geometry of this data, uh, or this experiment for nanobeam electron diffraction for NBED, uh, just it uh, looks very simple. You tilt your sample to a zone axis, and this movie shows how if the lattice spacing changes in the directions perpendicular to the beam, you get expansion or contraction of your lattice spots. So if, you, if your sample's in tension along a given axis, your spots move closer together, and if it's in compression, they move further apart. It's just an inverse uh, uh, image of the lattice vectors here. And so all we need to do is do um, some kind of template matching or correlation or convolution, whatever you want to call it, and measure the disk positions. And if we can measure them with high accuracy, we can measure the strain. And so that's what we've done on this same sample, this multi-layer sample here. And so on the upper left, this is the sort of conventional image formed. Um, uh, just using the STEM annular dark field detector. And you can see the multi-layer stack here. But for each one of these pixels, we have a full diffraction space image. And the average one of those is shown in panel B here, the, the uh, seabed average pattern here. And so by measuring the position of the two red disks, the 002 and the 220, with respect to the blue disk, we can make a strain map shown in C and D for perpendicular and parallel to our sample, respectively. And so this time, though, our field of view is significantly larger. You can see the scale bar is 50 nanometers um, in C. The white box shown is the size of the high resolution, atomic resolution strain map shown in the previous couple of slides uh, before. So we've increased our field of view by a factor of 10. And there's actually almost no limit to this. Uh, we, can, we can scan over as big an area as we want. And so once we verify that there's no in-plane strain here in D, we could even change the dimensions of our scan, and we could scan through the entire film. We could do a micron along the growth direction and maybe make it only 20 nanometers wide, for example. Uh, but of course, the first question you might have is, is this as accurate as the conventional atomic resolution strain map? And so if we compare the two, uh, uh, Barack's uh, uh, plot here in the upper left and upper right, you can see the comparison between the high resolution STEM uh, atomic resolution GPA strain and the nanobeam electron diffraction 4D STEM experiment. And so in the, in the parallel or perpendicular to the growth direction scan in A, you can see um, it's a noisy pattern, but overall the strain values are zero. Uh, and they do shift a little bit between the between the two different lattices. And if you go into the other direction, in this case, uh, um, along the growth direction, the epsilon y y strain uh, comparison in B between HR stem, the conventional experiment, and our 4D NBED experiment, you can see they're in very very good agreement. The NBED has one minor limitation, and that's there's there's a sort of finite size to our probe. Our probe is somewhere around a nanometer, and so you get a little bit of blurring between the adjacent layers because the sample is fairly thick here. Um, but overall, I think it's a pretty good trade-off because it doesn't have the noise of the HR stem scan. So the each individual uh, maxima and minima here is usually monotonic. It doesn't sort of oscillate up and down inside the layer.
Um, and then, like I said, the other major advantage is the field of view is more or less unlimited. We only have to sample uh, our, our experiment here, we only have to put our probe positions finely enough to see all of the layers in the multi-layer stack. Uh, that's our only limitation here. Uh, okay, so uh, NBED strain two is more or less automated. The GATAN STEMX code will, will sort of do it all for you now. Uh, so you can go right from a 4D STEM experiment to a strain map more or less live on the microscope now, which is pretty damn handy. Uh, after doing data extraction, of course. Uh, okay, so this is the last plot I'm going to show from here, showing another major advantage. So this is a huge field of view, a micrometer by a micrometer. The conventional image where you, where you look at atomic columns, everything has to be almost perfectly on the zone axis. And the reason is, is if you can't see the atomic columns, you can't measure the strain. You can't measure their position with high precision. But we're not limited in 4D STEM NBED strain measurements to that type of uh, um, zone axis alignment. If there's a defect, for example, a dislocation, you can see a couple of them in this uh, panel in A, we can still get the local strain field everywhere around it, as long as we can still see at least two diffracted disks that are perpendicular to each other. So in B and C, we can now see the perpendicular and parallel strain fields again, but in the presence of defects. And as you can imagine, this is definitely very, very important because a lot of these devices, uh, the performance is limited by the most defected regions, not by the most uh, perfectly grown regions. And so in D, we're showing the box in blue in B plotted, showing the extreme consistency of this measurement. So even as you trace along an almost an entire micron, about 900 nanometers, we measure the same strain value everywhere in the film which is expected because it has the exact same composition and the exact same uh, thickness of the multi-layer stack here. Uh, and so this really, I think, demonstrates the power of 4D STEM for measurements like this. Uh, one last thing I'm gonna show from this too. We, we can once again do multiple experiments. We have a full diffraction pattern under every probe position. Here we're showing strain, but why not also, for example, measure the thickness? So if we, if we look at the mean seabed image for the substrate here, and I want to figure out how thick the substrate is, on the right-hand side, I'm showing a calculated library of seabed patterns. And if I fit the mean absolute difference between each one of these patterns and our experimental seabed pattern, I can come up with the, the minimum error plot here. And they're not identical. Most of the fine details are pretty good, but there's a couple fall-offs that are, are a little bit stronger in the simulation than they are in the experiment, probably due to inelastic scattering blurring out the signal a little bit. But overall, if I plot the error, you can see it reaches a pretty strong minimum, the, the minimum in the mean absolute difference at a thickness of 40 nanometers. So we can be pretty sure our sample is 40 nanometers. And I could have gone through this same exercise with sample tilt, for example, and I could have resolved exactly uh, how close the orientation is between the substrate and the film, let's say, just by measuring the asymmetry in the diffracted disks, um, as long as I can do a multi-slice simulation here. Uh, okay, and so this is just one last plot. We also wanted to sort of estimate our resolution. Now that we know our sample is 40 nanometers thick, we can look at our, at our distance from the center of the probe, the sort of spread of the probe. I plotted the cumulative intensity here. And we can see, for example, that 75% of our probe is inside about, about uh, 0.5 nanometers at a thickness of 40 nanometers. And this is all from the simulation. So we would estimate that our resolution, our spatial resolution of the strain field is probably about half a nanometer, somewhere between half a nanometer and one nanometer, because uh, uh, we can estimate our thickness of our sample with high precision here. So once again, a single data set collection, but multiple experiments performed after the fact. And that, that's the uh, real power here of this method. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the longest section here, phase contrast imaging in STEM. So it's kind of a huge field. This is not intended to be a comprehensive overview. This is just the various phase contrast imaging methods that we use here currently, that we've implemented here. And I'm gonna run through the ones that do, do not require a direct electron detector um, and a couple of methods that do require a direct electron detector. So 
I'm just going to very, very briefly outline phase contrast imaging too. It's somewhat different than STEM imaging. All the previous images I've shown have been incoherent images, but phase contrast by definition almost is, is usually coherent imaging. So I'm just going to throw up a quick simulated image. I grabbed a sample off of Wikipedia, uh, some random biological sample, and I created a weak phase image. And so the weak phase image just means it's equal to a carrier wave of one, and then it's the, the sample potential here that I plotted multiplied by the imaginary constant where the sample potential is very, very small. In this case, about 0.1 rads. So quite, quite small with respect to the carrier wave. So if I were to stick this in my microscope, a light microscope or an electron microscope and take a picture of it, this is what I would see. Pretty exciting, eh? Uh, the problem with imaging a weak phased object is that when you're in focus, you see no contrast. And that's because uh, um, you need to either introduce aberrations or somehow modulate the phase to transform some of the phase signal into intensity signal. And that's because uh, for a weak phase object at least, the phase is not, uh, not observable quantum mechanically, only the intensity of the electron wave is. So if I introduce some kind of aberration, the typical one is defocus. Here I'm flipping between plus and minus four micrometers defocus. The invisible phase signal becomes visible and we can see a lot of the fine structure of the sample. Alternatively, uh, some of you might be familiar with another way to see phase contrast images. If I look at the diffraction pattern of the signal just by taking the Fourier transform and I were to place a Zernicki phase plate over top of it, if I phase shift the entire diffraction pattern by pi over two radians with respect to the center beam, so I leave the center beam alone, I just phase shift all the diffracted pixels, I form an image like the one on the right. And so that's another alternative way of turning invisible phase contrast into intensity contrast. Uh, okay, so why do we care about phase contrast? We can form beautiful atomic resolution images. This is a multi-slice simulation here of a crystalline silicon tip with two nanometer outer shell of silicon dioxide. And the image is quite, quite sharp, quite clear. You can see a little bit of contrast in the amorphous region and quite a bit of contrast in the zone axis aligned silicon columns here in the center. And this is, silicon's not a particularly heavy atom but we can still see a pretty big amount of contrast. But if you look at the scale bar, I'm plotting only zero to 5% of my total probe intensity. So this conventional incoherent annular dark field stem image is simply not very dose efficient. We're only getting contrast uh, with about half a percent to about 5% of our probe. But if I could take a phase contrast image of this sample, and this is the same simulation, but using a phase contrast imaging method, and I'll talk about the details of this in a couple slides here, um, we can see a much, much, much higher signal to, to noise here. And that's because now our total signal re uh, region is going from about minus 15 to plus 35%. So we're using 50% of our probe instead of less than 5% of our probe. And if I blow up the contrast in the image on the left, now I'm only plotting from zero to 1%. You can see you do form pretty reasonable contrast in your amorphous region of your sample but it's simply very, very dose inefficient. You would need roughly 50 times more electrons to get the same signal to noise. And the phase contrast image isn't perfect. It's much harder to interpret, for example. You can see it doesn't sort of have the thickness fall off that the conventional image does, but the dose required to image the sample on the left would absolutely destroy it, amorphous silicon dioxide in this case. So if we wanted to image such a sample, we have to use phase contrast. So the simplest uh, uh, possible method, if I just make a quick simulation here, um, this is just showing a diffracted probe and a sample, which is just gold nanoparticles on an amorphous carbon sample. So once again, a multi-slice simulation, and I show the conventional measurement here. As I scan the probe across my sample surface, you can see in the far field, the detector um, measures a shift of the intensity of our center probe here. And so in particular, if I sort of pause this movie and I go back to the nanoparticle and I scan across it, on the right-hand side of the nanoparticle, electrons are deflected to the left towards the center of the particle. And if I move to the other side of the particle, the left-hand side here, more electrons are deflected to the right. And so this is the basis of the first simplest phase contrast imaging, imaging um, modality here, which is usually called DPC differential phase contrast. So 
a simple sort of example here, if I move the probe across a step in my sample potential, this sort of locally induced phase shift, we get a very slight change in our probe. If I blow up that step intensity uh, to a, or the, the sample potential uh, peak to valley here, you can see a lot more easily the sort of signal channel here. We can see a shift in our diffracted intensity left to right. So the simplest way to form a DPC image would be to measure the derivative of this uh, potential by measuring a differential signal between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the probe or the top and the bottom of the probe. And so you would need at the very minimum a detector that has four pixels. And you can see I've drawn it in red here, the type of pixel geometry required to make a DPC measurement. And I'm not gonna go into the details too much for this type of measurement, but from these derivatives of the potential, you can use Fourier methods or, or other Poisson type method solvers to reconstruct the sample potential. And this has been demonstrated by Shibata and others at atomic resolution here. So this method is fairly sensitive uh, and it's very, very easy to implement because, because you only need four pixels on your detector here. But the disadvantages are it's still, still not that dose efficient and it's somewhat hard to interpret your images because you don't know if the shift of your, of your beam, the sort of induced phase shift, is due to sample tilt, thickness variation, composition variation, et cetera. And you need adjacent probes because this is a derivative measurement. So if you don't have many, many different probes, um, you can't sort of reconstruct what the underlying potential was. So the other uh, uh, method for phase contrast that you all might be familiar with is electron tychography. So this is very, very similar to DPC, but taking a more direct approach. So I'm just gonna run through how we do tychography here using a non-iterative method, but there's quite a few different methods you can use to reconstruct the sample. So if we have a 4D stem diffraction uh, pattern here, or a set, of, set of diffraction patterns where we have a real signal underneath each probe position, we can actually take the Fourier transform with respect to probe position, and we get a complex four-dimensional data cube. And for each one of these sort of uh, um, spatial frequencies, uh, we can calculate a virtual detector for each spatial frequency present in our sample. We multiply these two together, and then we get a phase corrected interference pattern of our sample probe interaction. So we, we more or less, at least in the simple sense, have deconvolved the probe from our measurement. And this is, this is a huge simplification. You should uh, uh, read papers on electron tychography if you really wanna delve into the methods here. Uh, but the result is in each one of these virtual detectors, you can sum over them to get a complex signal here. Uh, and then if you take the inverse Fourier transform, you have reconstructed your sample potential. And so you can do other fancy things with tychography, like for example, uh, deconvolve aberrations in your probe. So that's a major advantage over DPC. You're, you have a massively overdetermined amount of data about, about your sample. And so you can perfectly reconstruct it with an aberration free probe here. And it's also a much higher signal to noise too, because interference of your adjacent probes massively suppresses noise here. And then finally, you can also do iterative tychography where you refine the probe to improve the reconstruction quality. And so examples from, from our postdoc here at NSEM Howe, these are, these are just a couple particles and a gallium nitride wedge. Uh, on the bottom signal really shows what I wanted to talk about here about why we do phase contrast. The conventional images, the ADF in E and the ABF image in F, you get really, really good contrast for the gallium atom, but very poor contrast for the nitrogen. So it's hard to make a precision measurement. But if you look at the tycho tychographic reconstruction in G and H, in particular, the phase of your tychographic complex reconstruction, you can clearly see both the gallium sites and the nitrogen sites. So this is the advantage of phase contrast imaging. It is much more dose efficient. So other tychography experiments we do at NSEM, this is an all inorganic halide perovskite. And once again, the annular dark field uh, image if it has quite low signal to noise because we didn't want to damage the sample here. If I calculate a mean unit cell, and then I compare that to the tychography mean unit cell, you can see in particular the oxygen, or I guess bromine, sorry, uh, in the sample, excuse me, the lighter, lightest atom present, uh, you don't get a lot of information in the conventional annular dark field ADF image, but you can really, really precisely measure the shift of the, of the octahedra, the sort of dumbbell shifts of the tychographic image here. And a couple other quick examples here. 
uh, inorganic halide perovskites or 2D materials, molydisulfide, very similar to the tungsten disulfide I showed before, or zinc oxide here, another very, very beam sensitive sample. And I just wanted to show these examples too, to point out that there are some drift artifacts due to the long recording time, but this is sort of one of the reasons why we wanna push for higher camera speeds. And the K2IS uh, base frame rate, for example, is 400 frames a second, but one of the modifications that Catan has done for us is to allow 800 frame per second or 1600 frame per second recording on a much smaller subset of the camera. Uh, so you get half of the pixels or a quarter of the pixels, but you can run twice or four times as fast, which does help with some of these drift artifacts here. Okay, so the third phase contrast method I'm just gonna briefly discuss uh, is called MIDI stem. And I'm not gonna go into too many of the details, but if I wanna compare a conventional stem image to the mini stem geometry here, uh, the two differences are we put a phase plate in the, in the probe forming aperture of our stem signal. And the phase plate has zones of zero and pi over two phase shift. And then we use the pixelated detector to record a 4D stem data set. And the operating mode is really simple here or the interpretation of the data. To, to form a phase contrast image, you add up all of the even ring electron counts and you add up all of the odd ring electron counts. And the real value of your signal is adding the even and the odd zones. And the imaginary value of your signal is, me is measuring the difference, the even electron counts minus the odd ring electron counts. And so it's called uh, MIDI STEM because it stands for Matched Illumination and Detector Interferometry. And it's because we're matching a virtual detector on our pixelated high-speed direct electron detector to the phase plate that we create. And so this is just a couple quick animations here. Yeah, that one looks a little better. Uh, just showing that if you compare the flat phase of the conventional experiment to the phase plate shifted uh, uh, image, you generate significantly more contrast because you're making an interference pattern in your, in your center beam of your probe where the diffracted disks overlap with the undiffracted disk. Uh, and so once again, same sort of animation. Now, if I show scanning our sample uh, our, our gold nanoparticle on carbon sample, you can see the addition of the phase plate has created a lot more contrast in our de detector intensity measurement here on our, on our uh, high-speed direct electron detector. And so this is also nice because this uh, um, isn't a derivative measurement. So each individual probe position gives us the local phase shift and the local amplitude of the probe here. We don't actually need adjacent probes, although we can use them. Uh, we can still do tychography on this. We just have to use a different guess for our initial probe here. And so just a quick comparison uh, simulations. If you look at a projected potential of that sample, the gold nanoparticles on amorphous carbon, the conventional bright field image looks okay at infinite dose, but it's very, very bad when you go to a reasonable electron dose. The annular dark field's a little bit better. Even at a reasonable electron dose, you can still see the gold nanoparticles, but all of the contrast in your amorphous carbon substrate, for example, is completely gone. But if you do the MIDI stem phase contrast imaging experiment, you can resolve with the same amount of dose, 500 electrons per angstrom squared. You can see details in both the gold nanoparticles and in the amorphous substrate. And so it's not all simulation. We have also done experiments here. This is one of the first ones comparing a conventional simultaneously recorded stem image. So this is uh, gold nanoparticles on amorphous carbon versus the MIDI stem image. And you can see I false colored the carbon to show that we get a lot of detail of its structure. And also the gold nanoparticles themselves were contaminated with a lot of carbon on the surface. That's totally invisible in the conventional image, but it's, it's much easier to see in the MIDI image. And so this, this shows too, that if you wanted to do like functionalized nanoparticles, phase contrast imaging is a much better bet than conventional imaging. Um, and so one last quick example here, these are functionalized nanowires. Uh, and if you compare the conventional image of the nanowire with a functionalized surface to the MIDI stem image, you can see a huge amount of difference in the signal to noise just because phase contrast is much more dose efficient. And if I false color the wire and its functionalized surface, you can see the conventional image doesn't show any of the functional group contrast whatsoever. And that's because it's an organic functional group here. It's primarily composed of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And those are too weak to scatter in a conventional image. But in a phase contrast image, you can get a lot of details of this functional layer here. Uh, okay, so one last quick uh, example. 
the latest one that we're working on for phase contrast, this is a very old idea. Cowley has a lot of good papers on it, actually, on two-beam stem holography, but we're going to use our phase plate approach here. If we place a diffraction grating into our probe-forming aperture, we can create additional diffracted probes beside our center probe, and that's what I'm showing on the right here. The probe amplitude in real space showing the center beam, the undiffracted beam, and then positive and negative diffraction orders to the left and the right. And so if I once again run that same animation here, now we have five beams scanning across our sample. And in the far field, we get a hologram. We get a very, very clear fringe pattern that shows the interference between all of our adjacent probes. So to use this experiment, ideally we would place our, our center beam in vacuum and we would interfere one or more adjacent beams and then measure shift of the fringes in the sort of classical holographic sense on our on our 40 stem recorded pictures of the diffracted probe and then use that to reconstruct the sample potential and so we're getting a little late on time so i'm just going to very briefly show if you if you do this single beam versus multi-beam the multi-beam annular dark field image shows ghost images of the adjacent particles but we have the full image of the fringe pattern under each probe and we can reconstruct the phase. And this is just a simulation showing very quickly the phase um, before deconvolution with the adjacent probes. But a, a sort of a cleaner experimental example, if I just look at the edge of this particle on a, on a carbon substrate here, um, and this is sort of what the diffracted signal looks like. If we clean it up and we switch from a mean seabed image to an electron counted seabed image where we lower the dose and we find each individual electron, we're clusterizing our data here, uh, we clean up the pattern quite a bit. And at this resolution that I put on the screen is too small to see the fringe pattern. But if I take the Fourier transform of it, you can see the diffracted positive and minus, uh, negative order there. So red circle around the center beam and then two red circles around our diffracted orders. And if I simply take those diffracted orders, mask around them and shift them to the origin and take the inverse Fourier transform, I can reconstruct the real value of my signal here. Uh, and this is just showing uh, um, that it is a hologram as I rotate around real versus imaginary here. If I, if I flatten it, if I use the substrate region to assume perfectly flat phase, I can generate a phase image that shows really good contrast here on this particle. And this is very, very low dose too. Only, only a couple thousand electrons under each probe position, I think. And I think we can go a lot lower than that too. And so this is the same image, but colored by the phase shift. And you can see the other major advantage of this multi-beam stem holography, because we have a, a reference wave here, we don't have to worry about strong phase shifts. So if we wrap through two pi, four pi, six pi, we can still get a very clean measurement. And this is something that DPC, Tychography, and MIDI stem can't do. They can't handle strong phase objects. Uh, if you look really closely at the edge of the particle, you can see single pixel wide shifts. That's because it's going through a couple pi. It's like three to five pi phase shift total there. Um, and so a quick summary of the phase contrast uh, methods here, just a quick compare and contrast. So DPC versus Tychography versus MIDI versus multi-beam here. Uh, when it comes to hardware, DPC is the clear winner. It's the only one where you really don't need a direct electron detector at all. Tychography, you can get away with only a couple pixels on the camera, but it's definitely a lot better if you have a full field camera. And then for software reconstruction, DPC and MIDI stem are very easy to reconstruct. Tychography, computationally expensive, and the multi-beam one also very easy to reconstruct. You just do an inverse Fourier transform. Uh, and then for the signal recovery, though, this is where tychography wins for the high spatial frequencies. And then for the low spatial frequencies, the thickness signal, the sort of phase wrapped signal, that's where multi-beam really wins out. And MIDI is about halfway in between those two. Um, DPC is great for sort of a live, very fast measurement. But just by switching to tychography, you get so much more uh, signal back. And you can refer to papers by Nellist and other people comparing DPC uh, to tychography. Uh, okay, so the last experimental section I'm going to discuss this morning, since we're running out of time, uh, is fluctuation electron microscopy. So this is typically used for, for amorphous or disordered materials. Uh, this is a, an image I grabbed from Paul Voyle's group website. If you have an incident electron probe on random clusters of atoms versus highly ordered clusters of atoms, you're going to get coherent diffraction forming a speckle pattern 
and, and you're going to get significantly more speckles under your ordered clusters than you will under your random cluster. And so if we use 4D STEM, we can, we can get really, really high efficiency fluctuation electron microscopy patterns. And sometimes in the literature, these are called send patterns for scanning electron nanodiffraction. Okay, so some quick experimental examples here. This is a room temperature sample versus a 200 degree annealed sample. And this is just showing some of the probes underneath the sample, the measured uh, uh, seabed patterns here. And this is uh, recorded on the Arias camera, so not a direct electron detector. And you can't really see much of a difference between these two. But if you do your processing, if you subtract the background, remove x-rays from the pattern, you fit the center of your ring with high accuracy, um, so that you can find the center of your probe. And then you do an annular integration. So you integrate for a constant uh, uh, radius around this pattern. You can then get these FEM plots. And so this, this is the standard FEM. You don't plot the mean intensity, you plot the variance at each different diffracted vector here. And so now you can clearly see in that first diffracted ring at about 4.2 4 inverse nanometers, the width of the peak corresponds to the degree of medium range order of the sample. So this metallic glass sample shows a large degree of difference in medium range order for room temperature or 150 C or 200 C growth here. Um, and so in the context of today's webinar, what I wanted to say is why we are specifically talking about direct electron detectors for FEM studies here. And so the first reason is we can collect a lot more images far more quickly. 10,000 images, so really, really good statistics on the K2IS camera here, 25 seconds to record. And because uh, of this high quantum efficiency and high speed of recording, we can switch to lower doses. And then the last major advantage is electron counting. By, by counting the same data set above, by switching from simply adding up all of the pixels to counting each electron event, event, I massively clean up the signal and I really increase the signal to noise. So the ramifications of that, if I were to plot the variance here, the same plot I showed on the previous slide for 10,000 images, if I only use a thousand randomly selected images, I get essentially the same FEM pattern. And in fact, if I use only 100 images, I get the same pattern and even 10 images, I get the same pattern. It's only when I switch to a single image that I start to actually see some noise here. And if I flip between um, randomly selecting other single images, 10 images, 100 images, etc. So here's just two other cases here. You can see you get a little bit of variance, mostly due to thickness of the sample. Uh, but overall, we could probably get away with as few as 10 to 100 images and still get really good FEM uh, signal here. And so this would really open the door, for example, to in situ studies, because you can just scan continuously while doing an in situ experiment. Um, and so direct electron detectors have really changed how we do business here for these, these FEM studies. Uh, okay, so more or less at the end of my talk, I just wanted to briefly mention image simulation because I am an image uh, analysis and simulation guy. We have a new STEM code that's a lot faster than previous ones. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the details of why it's a lot faster, but normal STEM scans require a separate simulation for each probe position. Our new code does not. It shares the computational burden between adjacent probes. And if you want to, uh, the mathematical details of that, feel free to check out my ASCII paper uh, shown below for advanced structural chemical imaging, sorry there. Uh, but we've also released an open source version of this code called Prismatic. And so these gigantic STEM simulations, if you want to do a simulation to see how 4D STEM would work for you, yeah, I would highly encourage you to grab this code. Uh, we have a really fancy GUI for it. It works for Windows, for Linux, uh, for, for um, OS X. Uh, and we also have a, a Python code for it. And just one last uh, slide here, just to show the speed difference. If you're doing a multi-slice simulation using our code or our new PRISM algorithm using our code, uh, you can go down from, from multi-threading implementation uh, with no GPU, about 150 milliseconds per probe position, to our four GPU version, you can get down to five milliseconds a probe. And if you switch to the PRISM algorithm, you can get all the way down to less than 0.2 milliseconds per probe. So that means you can do 5,000 probes every second. And that's how I do sort of these giant 1K by 1K STEM simulations uh, that I showed uh, in a lot of the previous slides here. Uh, okay, so with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. I have to acknowledge many, many people here. I have a lot of collaborators, both here at Berkeley Lab and around the world. Um, 
they are primarily responsible for all of these experimental data sets. I myself do not do a lot of experiments. I'm mostly a data science guy these days. Uh, and so thank you to my collaborators. And so with that, I think we can open it up for questions through the questions pane panel here on the, on the webinar control panel. Thank you so much, Colin. It was a very, very interesting and informative talk. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time for questions today. Uh, we have collected very, very good questions, um, several of them. So we will, um, we have them. We will uh, get the answers and we will email them back to people who submitted the questions uh, within a week. Um, so I would like to again thank you and thank everyone um, who attended this webinar and wish you all a great day. Thank you all so much.